Men Among the Ruins, Chapter 7, History, Historicism. At the end of Chapter 1, when discussing the premises proper to the revolutionary conservative idea, I declared my intention to return to the topic of historicism. I will do so in this chapter also in order to introduce the topics that I will analyze later. For example, choice of traditions, the third dimension of history, domestic clarifications concerning Italy. What I will say may cause a few difficulties for those who have not renounced the historicist mindset. We should begin by noticing that the emphasis given to the notion of history is recent and alien to every normal civilization. Much more so is the personification of history into some kind of mystical entity that is the object of a superstitious faith, as are many of the other personified abstractions that have become fashionable in an age that claims to be positivist and scientific. Many people are accustomed to writing history with a capital H, just as in the past the first letter of the name of a deity was capitalized. The first and more general meaning of historicism refers to the collapse or disastrous shift from a civilization of being, characterized by stability, form, and adherence to supertemporal principles, to a civilization of becoming, characterized by change, flux, and contingency. This should be our starting point. In a second phase, values have been inverted, and this caving in has come to be seen as a positive thing that not only should not be resisted, but also should be accepted, extolled, and willed. On this basis, the ideas of history, progress, and evolution have been intimately associated with one another. Thus, historicism has often appeared as an integral part of the progressive and enlightened 19th century, constituting the background of rationalist, scientific, and technological civilization. Aside from this, historicism in a specific sense is the basic view of the philosophy originally inspired by Hegel that was represented in Italy by the philosopher Benedetto Croce and Giovanni Gentile. I will now expound upon the spirit and the morality of the latter type of historicism. As it is known, Hegel saw a coincidence between the spheres of reality and of rationality, hence his famous axiom, everything that is real is rational, and everything that is rational is real. I will not examine this problem from a metaphysical perspective or subspecie aeternitatis from the perspective of eternity, However, it is certain that from a concrete and human point of view this axiom is dubious for two reasons. The first reason is that, in order for it to be useful, one would first have to know directly, a priori, and in a determinate way what must be called rational, and used as the order or the law that history and every event are always supposed to reflect. The disagreement among historicists on this issue is significant. The truth is that each one of them is inspired by his own subjective speculations on the level of college philosophy. What is truly lacking here is even the most modest bird's eye view that is required to grasp not only what lies beyond the world of phenomena, but also what is hidden behind the most evident cause of historical upheavals. The second reason is that even if we were to believe in what this or that philosopher postulates as rational, in the course of ordinary experience it is not possible to detect the complete identity of the rational and the real. Thus, we may wonder if one affirming this identity calls something real because it is rational or vice versa, if he calls something rational only because it is merely real or because it presents itself as factual reality. Even without engaging in an appropriate philosophical critique, as I have done elsewhere when I criticize so-called transcendental idealism, 
This suffices to expose the ambiguous and ephemeral character of historicism. It is precisely because we live in the world of becoming, which is characterized by a rapid change of events, circumstances, and forces, that on the one hand, historicism reduces itself to a passive philosophy of the fait accompli, and a theory that bestows a rationality on everything that has successfully asserted itself. On the other hand, historicism may equally promote revolutionary claims when one does not want to acknowledge the real as rational. In this case, in the name of reason and history, interpreted to one's advantage, a condemnation is passed on what is. A third solution is still possible as a mixture of the previous two, namely to label everything as anti-history, that seeks to assert itself or that tends to realize or to restore an order other than the existing one, yet without succeeding except to justify it and to lend a rationality to it in the case of its victory and assertion since by then it has become real. Thus, depending on the situation, historicism may be equally on the side of a second-rate conservatism or that of revolutionary utopias, or, as probably occurs more often, on the side of those who know how to adapt to changing circumstances, shifting allegiance according to which way the wind blows. Thus, history and anti-history become slogans devoid of any concrete content that may be used in both senses. According to personal preferences, in the context of a dice game that representatives of this view call dialectics or historical dialectics. The typical example of this was the development that occurred in Germany out of the premises of Hegelian historicism of both a theory of authority and of the absolute state on the one hand, a worthless theory behind a system that, being rooted in traditional values, had no need whatsoever for a philosophical justification, and of the Marxist revolutionary and dialectic ideology on the other. A more recent example in Italy is the enmity between Gentile and Croce, both of whom were committed historicists. However, Gentile, by assuming as rational what asserted itself in the political arena, bestowed the character of historicity upon fascism, putting his philosophy at its service. Conversely, Croce, due to his personal and ideological preferences, thought the rational corresponded to liberal anti-fascism. Thus, he stigmatized the fascist order, although it was real as being anti-historical. After the wind changed direction, many people who were yesterday's fascists awoke a few years later as anti-fascists. These turncoats may be regarded as the representatives of the third possibility, becoming up-to-date about what history and its rationality will desire from time to time. These brief references show what historicism amounts to. It is essentially a formless, useless, and vain philosophy, at times even cowardly and opportunistic. It is either unrealistic or coarsely realistic, depending on the circumstances. But aside from the lucubrations of historicism as a philosophy and the corresponding mental deformity of which a sector of Italian academic culture is guilty, we must expose the myth of history with the capital H, especially when this myth fosters the narcosis of those who are not aware of the forces they have surrendered to, and when it helps those who want the current to become more rapid, any opposition to cease, and the last dams to be broken, appealing to the sense of history, these people stigmatize every attitude different from their own as anti-historical or reactionary. This type of historicism, when it is not a senseless hallucination of shipwrecked people, is obviously the smokescreen behind which the forces of world subversion operate. Surprisingly enough, 
Even among those who yearn to restore the old order, there are some who are not aware of this. They are unable to reject the historicist myth in all of its forms, failing to acknowledge that it is men who make or undo history if given the opportunity. We must be opposed to any consecration and rationalization of the status quo and must deny any acknowledgement of the forces or currents that have assumed power. We should recall that the anathema of being anti-historical and outside of history is cast against those who still remember the way things were before and who call subversion by its name instead of conforming to the processes that are precipitating the world's decline. Having made this clear, man is restored to a fundamental freedom of movement. At the same time, the groundwork is laid for a possible investigation aimed at judging the effective influences that have promoted this or that upheaval in history. In regard to this first point, what I have said will constitute the introduction to the next topic, the choice of traditions. Having overcome all historicism, we are rid of both the idea that the past is something that mechanically determines the present and the concept of a theological, evolutionary, and transcendental law that, for all practical purposes, leads us back to determinism. Then, every historical factor will appear to have a conditioning role, but never a determining role. A possibility of an active attitude toward the past will be safeguarded, especially the possibility to uphold everything that is inspired by super-temporal values. After these general references, I wish to examine some historical problems concerning Italy.